And uh, our next speaker comes to us, uh, actually Perio Prost trained, originally coming from Mexico, uh, trained in dental school there, then went to Indiana uh, and uh, received his Perio Prost training. And he's going to share with us uh, essentially examples of the various protocols that are available to us uh, for patients. So please welcome Dr. Sergio Rubinstein. Thank you very much. I want to thank Danceplay for the invitation to be here and all of you for being present at the, this presentation this morning. You, the topic of the lecture is individualized protocols for patient center outcomes. Dentistry today, implant dentistry, is very sophisticated today. And the quality of restoration that we can obtain, implant and restorations, are very sophisticated. So the level of expectations for the patients get higher and higher. And what we like to do is always meet those expectations or even give them more than what they actually expect. So the topic of the presentation is management of aesthetic dilemmas and how to achieve outstanding results. The presentation, the slides that you're going to see, none of the, the slides have been computer enhanced. So whatever you see, it's actually what it turned out. And all the final restorative work has been done by laboratory technician Fujiki Toshiyuki. To achieve certain results, we need to always think. And to think is free. Not doing it is extremely expensive. Unfortunately, by the time we find that out, sometimes it's a little bit too late. And we wish we could have reversed certain things, but sometimes we don't have that opportunity. So communication is very important, not only in the office, but it's also going to talk to other specialists. So the more communication we have, the less uh, we can expect to have any kind of problems that the patient may have, any kind of disappointments, and us as well. And all this starts with a proper diagnosis. And hopefully a proper diagnosis is going to lead to a very good treatment plan and also the treatment. So success in implant therapy, we know patients have very high expectations today, and it's more than giving a patient a titanium fixture and a restoration. So when we're replacing a single tooth or multiple teeth, those expectations are very high from an aesthetic, functional, and health perspective. Success is achieved by treatment planning in a reverse pathway, by working from an aesthetic goal and working towards a healthy, supportive foundation. So here we have Marilou, 46 years old, and she's had two sets of crowns and she's very unhappy because no one has been able to deliver quality aesthetic dentistry that she always expected. And she wants a long-term stable result. Treatment started in 2003. And what we like to do is envision, we need to visualize what that final restoration is going to look like. So we need to understand texture, color, harmony between the adjacent teeth and what the surrounding soft tissues are going to provide a healthy environment for the patient to maintain this restoration long-term. So this can be achieved by placing the implant in the proper place. This implant was placed by Dr. Maurice Salama in Atlanta. We create a proper abutment, and we need to have that soft tissue profile that's going to allow us to have long-term stability. And that's created with a provisional. The days of just giving a patient an implant and a final restoration should be, for the most part, gone. This is what she looked like when the tooth was extracted. So we know that some bone regeneration, soft tissue manipulation had to be created between the restorative part and the surgical part as well. And this is what she looked like from the very beginning. And this is what we'd like to do when we see the patient. Understand what the patient looks like at the beginning and where we want it to be at the very end of treatment. This is the radiograph. We know that it had a hopeless prognosis, and we achieved a long, stable result, which is what the patient wanted. A little complication here is that the teeth are triangular in shape, and when we have a tooth that's triangular, it's very difficult to maintain that papilla. So a lot of manipulation needs to take place with the provisional. Tally is a patient that came from Toronto to Chicago, and she has congenitally missing upper laterals and upper canines, and she had orthodontic treatment done twice, we communicated with an orthodontist in Toronto. She did not want to go through further 
orthodontic treatment, and she does want and expect a long-term stable result. This started in 2013. So we communicated with the oral surgeon, Dr. Leslie David, which is an outstanding surgeon, and we asked her to place the implants a little bit closer to the laterals. I asked her to always have running room. I need running room because if the implant is not deep enough, aesthetically it could be a nightmare. The other thing that I ask her is to the implant to be placed in the cingulum area. Ideally, I would like to have the restoration screw retained, and we're dealing with a problem where the laterals and canines, that space is a little bit awkward, and we don't know what the final contours are going to be. So having a 3.5, 4.0 AstroTech implant at that time will give me some versatility because I wanted to have a screw retained restoration. So coming up from the single was essential. This is what it looks like when the implants were placed and she came into the office about four months later. So we're looking at it, the implant that she was able to place was a 3.0 and that changed my entire protocol. Because with a 3.0, I need to go with an Atlantis abutment that's going to actually be cemented. But the implant was in a very good position and we created a provisional and she left back to Toronto having the provisional for roughly five months. She came back to evaluate the tissue contour, and when we removed the provisional, we saw that the tissue would actually, it was, you know, her hygiene was very good, and the tissue response was very good to the provisionals. We did not do any alteration on the soft tissue. We felt that if it was going to be any kind of recession, that just time takes its own course. This is what it looks like when we remove the provisional, and this is not your normal contour, but we're also trying to reproduce here what a lateral and a canine look like. So what we ended up doing was adding a little bit of composite on the mesial of that premolar to make up for that deficiency of having two teeth and give the illusion that the premolar was actually a canine. We took a final impression because the tissue had already matured long enough. And now we need to decide how we're going to restore this case. What is the proper protocol for us? So if we're going to go with a 3.0 implant, which is what we have, the only option is to go with a custom Atlantis abutment. Sometimes I like to do a cast abutment, but this was not an option on a 3.0 implant. So we know we have a short tooth. The contour is not the normal emergence profile that we normally see, and we have a very wide space. So if the restoration is going to be temporarily cemented on a patient that lives out of the country, it's not that easy for me to have it re-cemented or if it's permanently cemented and I want to come back to adjust maybe the composite on the adjacent teeth, we don't have that option. So what are we going to do and how can we do this as a screw retained restoration? It's a little bit more complicated. So how something appears is always a matter of perspective. And that's why we need a team approach and always try to communicate with all the uh, different disciplines. We took a final impression. This is the emergence profile that we obtained. So we're looking at it. This may be a little bit too deep for my taste, but I asked for that running room. I needed that, and I needed that stability. So we designed an Atlantis abutment, decided to go with the gold, the gingival hue, to have a restoration that's going to be a little bit more aesthetic, even though we had good running room. Over the abutments, we have the crowns that Toshi designed, and then he stuck the porcelain, and we had the lingua open to create a cementable crown over the titanium abutment, the Atlantis abutment. So when you're looking at this profile, this is not your traditional profile, but we're also replacing an area that's not anatomically what we envision, having two teeth with only one implant. So we take a look in the model, we have enough clearance for the final restoration, and Toshi places the porcelain, so you get proper contours, and these restorations can actually blend with the anatomy from the adjacent centrals. So a problem that was quite complex, we tried to simplify it. And the way we do this is we actually cement the crown in the laboratory. So we place some tape onto the abutment, and we cement this with a resin modified glass ionomer, and as we're cementing it, we keep pressing on the crown to make sure that it's properly sitting onto that Atlantis abutment clean up the excess, make sure that it's not going to create a problem with the screw axis. And as we're cleaning up the excess, and this is setting in about roughly uh, two, three minutes, 
we wait a little bit longer, then we unscrew the, the crown, and then we start polishing it in the lab. I really do not work that fast. You know, I advance the, the movie a little bit. And this is what the final restoration looks like. Very tempting to try to modify the gingiva on those laterals, but we decided again not to do it. With such a profile, I felt that it was going to be in a recession, it will not be a problem. And the patient was quite pleased with the final outcome. And here we have the radiographs showing what the patient looked like when the crowns were delivered. So we have a long-term stable result on a situation that was quite, quite complex at the beginning. And that's the tally smiling. So any kind of recession, we're hoping for Tali to come back. It's now a little bit over three years and she has not been back and we keep asking her. I want the pictures, I want radiographs, and she says she's happy. Half of everything that we know is wrong. Unfortunately, sometimes we do not know what half. We proceed with certain philosophies, certain treatments that we believe that this is exactly the way it's supposed to be done and may or may not be scientifically based. So we always need to question what we're actually doing and are we on the right track. Amanda is a 27-year-old female and she's not happy with her upper crown. She has an implant that was not properly placed. <clears throat> she wants a long-term stable result and she's gone from one dentist to another to another and she's hoping that she'll get a good aesthetic result this time around. So when we saw her, we took a radiograph and these are the words that came out of Amanda's mouth. She says, I don't like the color. I don't like the proportion. I don't like the texture. I don't like the shape. I don't like the gingiva. And I, the diastomas do not bother me. So when a patient gives me that terminology, I'm worried. Because this patient already knows a little bit too much. So it's OK to have a patient that's informed, but maybe the expectations are a little bit higher than what we can provide for the patient. So looking at her smile, and of course, all cosmetic cases, we always have to take pictures. And we know that the color is definitely not right. And she said that the diastomas do not bother. She actually happens to be a model, and she has not been able to model for a couple of years. So the gingiva is very high. And when we look at the provisional that she had, and we look at the soft tissue, when I see soft tissue like this, I actually am feeling quite optimistic. Why? Because if the tissue was healthy, what is there to change for us? So what we need to do is create a better abutment and hope, no, we cannot promise, hope that we'll have a good result. So a new abut an impression was taken, the abutment was prepared, and we made a provisional, especially under contour on the gingival area, completely the opposite of the case that we saw with Tally. Why? Because we're hoping by having an under contour gingival emergence profile, hopefully the tissue will come back. So this provision had to be modified several times. We trace a line with pencil in the mouth, and we just kept modifying this. And it took about roughly four months of modification, taking out the provisional, making it narrower at the gingival. And this is the result that we obtained after the patient having a provisional for roughly eight months. So it's important that where the tissue was at the beginning, we had to let this new tissue mature long enough. So in addition to those four months, the patient had a little bit over four months with the final uh, provisional, and then we can remove the provisional and take a final impression. But do we want to have this crown cemented? It's a little bit of a problem because we know that the tissue is very friable. So we elected to do a screw retained restoration. He, this is all designed in the lab. So when I got the crown back from Toshi, and that happens to be three steps from my uh, treatment room, I said, Toshi, this is not the contour that we want. This is a convex contour, we want it to be concave. So he had to modify it. The way he designed, the intaglio is going to actually engage and rest right over the primary screw. And the lingual screw is going to go through the lingual of the crown and entirely go through the center and stops on the inner part on the buccal segment of the metal to give us some stability. People think that this is very complex, but this is all done in the lab. And it's actually not that complex as long as you have a lab technician that can give you that support. This is what the tissue looks like after the provisional was removed. This is the final abutment, the insertion. And delivering this takes literally a minute and a half. Clearly, you need to have a gas to make sure that the patient is not going to swallow the screw. You don't want to drop this, uh, the screw. 
but you know, very carefully by screwing it in, you can give the patient a very stable result and we have retrievability, which in many instances is essential. This is the final radiograph and this is what the final crown looks like and the patient is actually smiling. So sometimes besides doing things the right way, it doesn't hurt to get lucky. I had the opportunity to publish this article uh, with Dr. Berlevin. He was the least leader uh, on this article. And we published this in the Journal of Aesthetic and Restorative Dentistry along with Dr. Lou Rose. Seven-year-old Randy comes to me after having orthodontic treatment for several years. And this treatment was started in 2002. Randy was seven years old with the problem of having congenital missing an upper left central incisor, multiple problems. You can see as he's growing the deep overbite, it's a little bit of a problem. And at 12 years old, things are starting to look a little bit better because we don't have that deep overbite. And at 13 years old, the orthodontist decides to refer the patient to me. And I ask, what took you so long to refer the patient to me just for maybe my opinion? I've been in the same place for 25 years. So this is what Randy looks like when I saw him for the first time. And I'm saying this is six years of orthodontic treatment, six years of growth, and I do not know what he expects from me. So to have the proper treatment, we must have the teeth in the correct place. So our first premolar was extracted, and we started to shift teeth to replace the missing central, but hopefully an implant. We know we have a very large defect, we know the anatomy of the central incisor is not correct. This orthodontist does not understand anchorage very well, so the teeth are shifting, they're all over the place. And the kid was not happy, mom was not happy. So what we decided to do was use a denture tooth with an orthodontic wire to guide the orthodontist and hopefully be able to close this space. So the orthodontic wire must be gingival enough not to interfere with the bite. And as we're looking where the occlusion is, and retracting the upper anterior teeth, we're starting to get in a better a proportion where the teeth are at in relationship to the future smile. So we're happy from where we started, where we're at. And yes, we know that we have a very large defect above the provisional, and we're hoping to be able to correct that in the future. So this is what Randy looks like you know, when the orthodontic treatment is completed. He's very happy, mom is very happy, but I do not like the protrusion that the teeth have. So what do we do from here? So we ask the orthodontist to continue retracting the teeth, but he doesn't get it. So are we going to just go ahead and finish the restorations, put an implant? From where we started and where we are now, it sounds like we might be a little bit picky, and it's not fair. So we refer the patient to another orthodontist. And we know that the profile is not the correct profile, I will look at the cephalometrics. So the patient and mom agree to go to the second orthodontist. And the second orthodontist started to retract the teeth because the protrusion was too excessive. This is what Randy looks like after the second round of orthodontics. And yes, we still have a central that doesn't have the proper shape. It's a little bit concave, but we'll deal with that later. So we use a sock down, place colloidal silver, and start doing the planning for a future implant. We know we're going to need a bone graft. We're hoping to place an implant, implant support provisional, final crown, and give the patient a night guard. So the planning is done digitally. In this particular case, the, the bone graft was done again by Dr. Maurice Salama in Atlanta. Lower anterior teeth had the connective tissue graft. Implant was placed. We made a provisional for Randy and he wanted to whiten his teeth, so he started to whiten his teeth, so he disappears, he goes to college, and we see him about six months later when he's finishing that semester. So the provisional looked very nice that they we gave it to him, but now, of course, it doesn't match because he has been whitening his teeth. So the next step is to select a shade. We're hoping to do a veneer on the upper central, but mom asked us if we can have something more conservative, so we did direct bonding on the upper right central incisor, and still let the tissue mature, let it heal. So from where we started and where we gave Randy the final crown, we actually came a long way. Had we not done the proper thing, which is the second referral to the orthodontist, he would have been committed for life and having an implant in the incorrect position. And I think that would have been a disaster. 
even if we could have graphed the vocal segment on the anterior teeth. The important thing is that we should not lose sight of your goals, because that can be very costly. And sometimes it's a little thing that takes place, and we do not understand what we wanted to do in the first place. And the last patient, Linda, 50 years, 56 years old, very apprehensive, because she's showing the metal collar on that crown. And she's not very happy. She's ex actually extremely apprehensive. He, very concerned with the aesthetics now and how this is going to be solved. And she does want an optimal aesthetic result. She was on oral biphosphonate therapy for about two years, and she stopped that therapy about three years prior to me seeing her. But number eight has a class two plus mobility. And this started in 2007. So we're taking a look at analysis of her smile. We know that there's some issues that need to be addressed. And the biggest problem is that number eight has no vocal plate. And she has very high expectations. So as the team got together, the patient was referred to me by the oral surgeon. I'm meeting for the first time the periodontist. And we're meeting at the orthodontist office and we're not on the same page. It's a problem. So how we communicate and we try to provide the patient with the best possible treatment requires interdisciplinary care. So after arguing for quite a while, um, we agreed that I was going to cut off the crown. I had to hold the root with one hand while I was trying to remove the post underneath and create enough room for a future super eruption of that tooth. We know that the tooth is hopeless, but the tooth is not useless. And if the orthodontic treatment will not work, we're losing a little bit of time and a little bit of money. But here we're going to have to redefine what time is. So the patient had a provisional. She tells me, Sergio, this is great. I'm done. Because we got rid of that metal collar. And she wants to walk out. She says, are you kidding? We're just starting. So what happened is she had the provisional. I want orthodontic treatment to be fast. What is the goal for my orthodontic treatment? To try to bring the root palatally. Hopefully have some soft tissue for a future bone graft but the orthodontist doesn't get it. I want to do orthodontics a certain way, and she wants to do it in a different way. So I said, you know, you just got to keep your mouth shut because you're not doing the ortho. So as she's super erupting the tooth, a year and four months later, patient still has this defect. And I call her and says, what are we doing here? This is a problem. I ask you to please bring that root palatally, not vocally. <coughs> She says, Sergio, there's nothing else to do. Orthodontic treatment is done, and she hangs up on me. So I go to the patient, and I said, you know, orthodontist says that the ortho is done. He says, what do you mean? I still have my defect. I said, we'll take care of it, but I'm not doing this today. You'll have to come back next week. So I said, maybe we'll have a second opinion. Having second opinions is always good. Who's sir. The person. Crossing the street, he says, Are you crossing? He <laughs> says, Yes, it's worse than not having the correct information. He's believing that you do. So we actually move forward believing that the information we have is accurate. So I took over for the ortho. I saw the patient the week after. And what we did is we changed the wire from a round wire to a nitinol wire. And if you can see, the bracket. The wire, the nitinol wire, is not engaging the bracket properly. And as the nitinol wire wants to go back into the original position, it's going to super erupt. And as it engages the inner slot, it's going to push the root palatally. This is where I inherited the ortho case a year and four months later. And after six weeks of orthodontic treatment, there was practically no root left. This is how much of the soft tissue grew. We made a provisional from the lateral cantilever in the central, clearly under contouring the gingival contour for the central because more tissue is better. We can always trim it, but if we don't have enough, that's an additional surgical procedure, and we're trying to minimize that. So what we did is we placed a wire to make sure that the lateral was not going to spin and rotate. We painted colloidal silver on the provisional, and we started to do the computerized planning, which is the oral surgeon's place. He's the one that referred the patient to me. And he wanted to do a bone graft first. And I said, you can do the bone graft. But from my perspective, I think you can actually have an implant at the same time. He said, no, 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 we need to do a bone graft. So he did a bone graft, let it heal for about six months. 
and then came back and placed the implant. To me, that's one additional unnecessary surgery that could have been accomplished in only one. This is the patient with the provisional, and unfortunately, we have the defect on the lingual. It required two additional surgeries to correct that lingual defect. From my perspective, it's three additional surgeries that were actually, from my perspective, not needed. So we did the planning with Atlantis abutment. In this case, it was zirconia abutment. And we take the impression we'd like to have two models. We have the individual one and a solid model, so we can actually evaluate the contours. But now we need to have a very long, wide contact. Why? Because the gum receded after these three surgeries, unfortunately. So here is the zirconia abutment, torque tightening into place and close, and both crowns permanently cemented. So we're able to correct the defect on the palatal area and achieve something that we consider is a highly aesthetic result. And this is the patient smiling. She's happy. I'm pleased because I know that the case could have actually been better. Perfection is our goal, but excellence will be tolerated. <laughs> so sometimes we feel that we want to do a little bit more. We need to do a little bit more. Are we doing this for the patient or are we doing this for ourselves? In conclusion, cement versus screw retaining implant crowns, it's actually both. In some instances, it can be a choice, sometimes it's an indication. But such decision must be discussed during treatment planning and prior to implant placement. This is son, what specialty will you choose? Implantology? He says, no, I'm going to be an endodontist. <laughs> That's something we don't have to worry about. This will not affect us. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Sergio, thank you. Thank you. I'm still chuckling from that video. <laughs> <laughs> the blind leading the blind. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that was fabulous. But thank you so much for sharing all that excellence. Great outcomes and obviously tremendous dedication to creating those outcomes. So we appreciate your time today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.